This channel is part of the History Hit Network. The world is changed forever by a new technology, nuclear. Two superpowers dominate the world, each facing the other in a state of neither war nor peace. This is the story of the Cold War, how the push of one button could lead to total global destruction. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. How the struggle between two political systems caused millions to suffer. Spy was very much part of the Cold War. and how a world was created which lived in constant fear. Mad World, Mutually Assured Destruction. In this episode, a hydrogen bomb, a thousand times more destructive than the first atomic bomb. The shock waves of the world's first H-bomb rush towards the onlookers and spellbound, they watched something never seen before. Because it was the cornerstone of mutually assured destruction. A new war brings the world to the brink. The unexpected entry of 300,000 red Chinese across the Manchurian border may well precipitate World War III. Western countries join forces against the USSR. If one NATO nation is attacked, it is, in effect, declaring war on the whole of NATO. And no one trusts anyone. And one forgets about it, you know, the kind of paranoia and all that, because it's a different world, it's a different mindset completely. Summer 1949. The USA is the only country in the world in possession of the atomic bomb. Each one can vaporize over 70,000 people. The USSR has the largest armed forces in the world. Many believe they plan to use them to expand their territory. I must not conceal from you tonight the truth as I fear. It is certain that Europe would have been communized like Czechoslovakia and London under bombardment some time ago, but for the deterrence of the atomic bomb in the hands of the United States. You know, competitive advantage is a very difficult thing to keep, whether it's a business, a person, a country. The atomic bomb makes the West feel safe. That secure feeling is about to be blown away. The stunning news has the atom bomb and has exploded it, bursts on America. Russia's first bomb is codenamed First Lightning. It is detonated on the 29th of August, 1949, in what is now Kazakhstan. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. You got that sense of humanity being in danger of annihilation. Stalin knew about it. Uh, Russians were already working on a similar kind of a project and were provided some information by the, their own spies and by willing parties in, in the United States who felt that the Cold War had to be a bit more balanced, that they didn't like the fact that America was the only one possessing the super weapon. It may well have taken them another five or 10 years to develop that capability on her own. Now Russia has the secret. 
It was, of course, inevitable, but President Truman's announcement came as a bit of a shock to many of us. People in the West are chilled by the news of the Soviet bomb. Their cities are now under the shadow of this horrific weapon. One immediate effect of the announcement of Russia's atom blast is to tighten security regulations at all atom installations. kept on their toes by constant target practice, and they have orders to shoot to kill at any suspicious stranger. Every inch of the Hanford plant is patrolled from the air, and for the most up-to-date roadblock, watch the following scene. Now the Soviets have the bomb. The Cold War has begun in earnest. Both sides have the means to destroy entire cities with one stroke. It was the cornerstone of mutually assured destruction. The Soviet Union and its agents have destroyed the independence and democratic character of a whole series of nations in Eastern and Central Europe. But will the USSR stop there? Troops are building up in Eastern Europe. Are they there to enforce Soviet domination, or are they preparing to attack? It is this ruthless course of action and the clear design to extend it to the remaining three nations of Europe that have brought about the critical situation in Europe today. The countries of Western Europe are too small to defend themselves if attacked. A pact is drawn up to use U.S. military might to protect Western Europe. Representatives of Europe's anti-communist nations recently met Mr. Atchison, America's Secretary of State, to discuss military aspects of the North Atlantic Pact in Washington. Made of vital. It had various clauses, and clause four stated, if one NATO nation is attacked, it is, in effect, declaring war on the whole of NATO, and all of NATO countries will come to the defense of that country and deter the aggressor. 12 nations sign NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. In Washington, the signing ceremony of the North Atlantic Treaty was inaugurated by Secretary of State Dean Acheson. I welcome warmly to our country and our capital the foreign ministers who have assembled here to sign the North Atlantic Treaty. Our peoples do not want war and do not glorify war, but they will not shrink from it if aggression is threatened. The NATO alliance unifies the armed forces of Western Europe into one giant military force. The USSR sees it as preparation for war. There are those who claim that this treaty is an aggressive act on the part of the nations which ring the North Atlantic. That is absolutely untrue. For us, war is not inevitable. American arms and men are moved to Europe. We had to work on their territory, so there was greater cooperation. And in general, it was a good countermeasure to the superiority of weapons and people that the Soviet Warsaw Pact had. The Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact forces were not happy about NATO. They would have preferred NATO was not as strong or as united. Britain, France, and their allies now have access to the latest in American military technology. Here's an enlarged 16 millimeter film of an ejector seat demonstration by the American Air Force. The fast speeds at which jet planes now travel make ordinary bailing out impractical. The Americans call this Tarzan the bullseye bomb. Although at first sight it may look like any other blockbuster, you soon see how it differs as a B-29 Superfort takes it up for target practice. The bomb, in fact, is a radio-directed missile. 
Watch it on the way down and you'll see it move over to the right in response to remote control. But will it hit the bullseye? Yes, there's absolutely no doubt about that. It's right on the beam. June 1950. Atomic bombs will be shipped across the Pacific, ready for use. Since the end of World War II, the nation of Korea has been divided. The communist North and the capitalist South. South Korea, of course, was a dictatorship and um, there were many people languishing in political prisons. Both sides want a united Korea on their terms. There'd been lots of saber rattling on both sides. So both the North had been you know, threatening to invade and the South had also been you know, threatening to march to Pyongyang and so on. South Korean villages awoke to a world suddenly filled with noise and flame. The communists made bold by months of small scale raiding across the 38th parallel had finally launched their undeclared all-out war of conflict. The North is allied with the Soviet Union. Pro-USA South Korea is caught unprepared. Soldiers of the South Korean army are here seen on their way to the front. Hopelessly equipped against the Russian armed Northern communists, they fought a delaying action as best they could. Spearheaded by tanks, the Red Forces had moved swiftly. In two days, they were attacking the capital city itself. The Korean War was actually the Cold War getting a little hot. Seoul is quickly captured by the North Koreans. The United Nations is not even five years old but it responds immediately. Within two days, the order goes out to send UN troops into Korea. A United Nations force was created, although it was very much directed by the United States. UN involvement was critical because it gave us legitimacy. The peoples of the free world acting under the United Nations have given their answer, and the United States, in a swift, bold decision, has already gone into action. So the United Nations actually, very soon after its creation, becomes a combatant in a war. It's not in a peacekeeping role, it's actually on one side in the war. And that has very long-term implication. Throughout the free world, these moves to halt the Reds are welcomed, whatever the consequences. Despite the bravado, the United Nations frontline troops are dangerously undersupplied. We were not prepared. We found ourselves outmaneuvered, out-equipped. But soon, more troops from across the globe arrive. The British were the first United Nations troops to reinforce the Americans. They go to play their very important part in the latest battle against communist domination. My elder brother fought in the Korean War as a National Service soldier but he doesn't say much about it because it was real hell. Support from the USSR for North Korea quickly becomes obvious. Here's the North Korean pilot who flew across in a Russian-built MiG-15 jet fighter to surrender to the United Nations. Also in the bag is this Russian-built armored car together with a 76 millimeter field gun. Those markings clearly show its Soviet origin. This is not just a Korean War. It is a proxy war, a struggle between the USSR and the West on Korean soil. I'd like to ask uh, whose troops are attacking deep in the country of somebody else? Who has the influence and the power to call off the invading Northern Korean army, the Soviet Union. 
a tenth of the Korean population will die. Soldiers from 16 UN member countries will serve, from the UK and Canada to Turkey, Thailand, and the Philippines. Tens of thousands of troops from all over the world will be killed or seriously injured. I saw three tanks. They cut loose with machine gun fire, shooting my left forearm completely off. I fell on the ground and was trying to crawl away when I noticed one of the red uh, crawl out of his tank and came up over me and fired three shots down at my chest, and which one of them came out in the front. Then, a surprising turnaround. One of Mobitone's cameramen flew with a recent mission carrying supplies to a United Nations battalion completely surrounded by the enemy. Ammunition, food and water were accurately dropped by parachute. Less than six months into the war, the UN troops have the upper hand. The first pictures of the reoccupation of Seoul by South Koreans show Marines of the Republic engaged in street actions. Following the brilliant work of the American Marine advance guards, these troops were mopping up stragglers, interrogating and searching North Koreans throughout the city. The capture of Seoul had been a tough job, and it was inevitable that many civilian casualties should occur in the process. Some estimates indeed have put them at over 20,000. And now, with United Nations sanction, comes the crossing of the 38th parallel to finish the story of North Korean aggression. As UN troops surge forward, Reports from the front line are full of confidence. The shattered communist forces are pulling back into the last corner of this peninsula they had set out to conquer. UN troops follow as fast as the tortuous terrain and increasing cold will allow. UN troops overrun most of North Korea, all the way to the border with China, the Yalu River. The village of Hai San Jin huddles against the banks of the Yalu across from Manchuria. Here, men of the 7th Division set up their outposts. The tide has indeed turned suddenly. All honor to the American soldier and his officers who have achieved such resounding victory so swiftly. December 1950. Everyone thinks the war is nearly over. Even the incredible cold does not seem such a threat. Korean winter was now setting in pretty fast. Witness the fact that paddy fields had become skating rinks. But the threat to these soldiers, Korea, and the entire safety of the world is building on the horizon. The next move will take the world to the edge of nuclear war. The unexpected entry of 300,000 red Chinese across the Manchurian border may well precipitate World War III. The problem was that once uh, the UN and US forces marched north, then they continued up towards the Chinese border. And China was quite reluctant to get involved in many ways. If you think about it, it makes sense. They'd only just come out of a terribly destructive civil war of their own. But as soon as they felt that their sovereignty might be threatened, then, then they, they came in. The manpower resources of the Chinese military surge forward. Down there below are some 20,000 American troops, somehow withstanding the bitter cold and driving snowstorms, encircled by hordes of Chinese communist forces in the hills. Yes, just about as hard and perilous a situation as it's possible to imagine. Casualties were heavy, both from enemy fire and from frostbite, and large numbers were evacuated by air. It's also a terrible place to wage war. because the hills are murder for infantry. And the other thing is, is it's cold. Cold weather was hard on us. As the communists moved south toward Tejan, we pulled back across the Kuhn River. All seems lost for South Korea. Despite the support from fighter planes, 
the UN forces make a costly retreat. The 29th Brigade took the main shock of the Chinese offensive at the end of April, and the stand of the Gloucesters and the mortar troop saved the situation. Only about 50 of the battalion got back out of 600. The Korean War becomes a massacre. And not just for the military. For hundreds of thousands of civilians trying desperately to outrun the advancing communists, the journey southward was a nightmare of cold, weariness, and confusion. The children who had no part in the causes of war received full measure of its hardships just the same. Terrible things that were done on both sides. I think we have to say that in retrospect, certainly. I mean, many massacres on, on both sides of the border. It's particularly part of the problem of having a war that was both a civil war and an international war, and in a way, a, a kind of proxy Third World War. Um, so the civilians bore the brunt of the suffering. In spite of all difficulties, more than a thousand Korean orphans were evacuated by air. As a 5th Air Force chaplain explained, we just couldn't leave those kids there to die. One of the sad parts of non-combatants caught in the middle of a conflict or battle is they're pretty much on their own. While the man and woman in uniform has at their disposal ambulances, hospitals, medication, evacuation systems that takes you all the way back to the States. None of that is available for the civilian. Once you decide to go to war, that is one of the problems that you will have to face with. Many civilians will die. Something has to be done, something drastic. We are fighting to keep the forces of communist aggression from making a slave state out of Korea. We are building up our strength in concert with other free nations to meet the danger of aggression that has been turned loose on the world. The strength of the free nations is the world's best hope of peace. By the end of 1950, the U.S. has 369 atomic bombs ready for action. But the United States did not know how many have been built in the Soviet Union. We are willing, as we have always been, to negotiate honorable settlements with the Soviet Union. But we will not engage in appeasement. While most people in the West are celebrating Christmas, President Truman has a terrible dilemma. Should the destructive power of nuclear weapons prevent their use? Or has the time come when military necessity takes precedent? The president has stated that the use of the atomic bomb is being considered to halt the communist onrush inspired by Russia. Where the stakes are very high, nuclear weapons out of the considerations. It was just a choreographed situation that was possibly spinning out of control. Truman makes the unthinkable decision. Atomic bombs are secretly transferred to U.S. bases in the Western Pacific. The U.S are preparing to drop them on cities and military bases in China. There were certainly people within the US who strongly favored using atomic weapons. Obviously, in a situation of war like that, there's always a risk. If the United Nations yields to the forces of aggression, no nation will be safe or secure. If aggression is successful in Korea, we can expect it to spread throughout Asia and Europe and to this hemisphere. It is no exaggeration to say that that 
problem is the gravest one now confronting the world. There's a very real fear that nuclear warfare in Korea could lead to Soviet attacks in Europe. Truman delays. His hope is that the employment of this devastating weapon will be unnecessary. But the final hope lies with the United Nations. As war in Korea rages, questions are asked. How did the Soviets get hold of the atomic secret? Morton Sobel, the principal in America's first atomic spy trial, leaves New York's federal court. The unseen war of uh, spying and counter-spying, which uh, goes on all the time. It's a war that uh, some Sometimes pops up in the public and sometimes doesn't, but it's a very important part of a nation's uh, preparedness for uh, defending its uh, independence. Spies, the undercover world of deception and double agents is the battleground of the Cold War. He's accused with Julius Rosenberg, electrical engineer, of conspiring to give Russia vital secrets of the atom bomb. Many of the top engineers and scientists uh, such as the Rosenbergs, had uh, grown up in New York and were very much part of the uh, socialist, international, and leftist circles. Harry Gold is seen here in Philadelphia just after he'd been granted postponement of extradition to New York for trial. He's accused of passing atomic secrets to Russia. And an American woman, Judith Coughlin, employed by the Department of Justice, was arrested with typed copies of secret documents. The ability of the Soviets to obtain atomic bomb secrets and intelligence was one of the great successes of the Soviets and failures of American intelligence. The USA and other Western countries are democracies. Their citizens support a range of political views. Some believe in communism. People who had sympathies uh, for that particular philosophy, and so that led uh, Soviet uh, espionage to a number of these people working on the Manhattan Project, and they were able to recruit them and to obtain their cooperation, sometimes not for money, but on the basis of you can't afford to let uh, one power have this uh, capability. A new and counterintuitive theory forms that the world might actually be a more stable place now that both sides possess the atomic bomb. You could argue that having deterrence on both sides actually creates some kind of guarantee that no one would use the first strike. It is the morbid philosophy of the Cold War. Some turn traitor and actively support the USSR. An obligation of every communist, the duty of any communist was to, uh, was to contribute to the world revolution, to turning the whole world into a socialist world. Russians would kind of stick to bread and butter uh, spying techniques, uh, such as honey traps, women, money, drugs. Then, shocking betrayal in Britain. It was in May 1951 that a worldwide sensation was caused by the sudden disappearance of the missing diplomats, as they came to be called. These diplomats are Guy Burgess and Donald McLean, two of what later emerge as the famous Cambridge Five Ring of Spies. Burgess and McLean defected. It, who knows, really? They certainly weren't going to have a very uh, enjoyable life had they stayed in the West. It was believed they had gone to Russia, and this was later confirmed. These were a group of spies, and it's really four that we know about, the fifth is only suspected, that were largely British, that were in possession of early secrets during and shortly after the Second World War relating to nuclear capability. They gave the secrets away to the, to the Russians, and it was very damaging. 
along with Kim Philby, Anthony Blunt, and a mysterious fifth man, their actions add to Western government's sense of paranoia. Any communist is considered a traitor. Investigative committees and prosecutions in the USA, led by Senator Joseph McCarthy, become hysterical. Of course, as far as war is concerned, we're at war with the communist half of the world. That war wasn't started by us. It can't be ended by us except by ultimate victory. Well, there's two or three kinds of spies. One kind is uh, those that have official cover. In other words, they have a diplomatic passport. Then they're uh, generally caught in, in, in declared persona non grata, which means they got 48 hours to get out of town and go back to, to Russia or, or come back over here. If they're a more deep cover agents, a non-official cover, and they get caught, well, then they can get locked up for you know, 25, 30, 40 years. The committee hearings become a witch hunt. Any American thought to have communist sympathies is accused of being a traitor. Edward J. Fitzgerald. I refuse to answer this question on the grounds that any answer I may give may tend to be self-incriminating. Hundreds of Americans go to jail. Thousands lose their jobs. Do you think that you have been guilty of any un-Americanism yourself? Uh, fighting communists and getting a bit rough with them, Mr. Uh, Hilly, is un-American, then I must plead guilty to being un-American. Frankly, McCarthyism means calling a man a communist who is later proven to be one. McCarthy probably was on the right theme, but it, it kind of got out of control and he became his own worst enemy. McCarthyism ramps up the persecution of people with communist sympathies. But trials like this have been going on in the USA since World War II, spearheaded by the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. The mass media of the time is targeted, including the Hollywood movie industry. Investigating alleged communism in Hollywood, the Washington Committee on Un-American Activities has been hearing the testimony of prominent film personalities. Question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way in which any American citizen can frame his then answer you denied, to the question then which you, invades his, absolutely invades his Then you right. deny to, you, you refuse to answer that question, is that correct? I have told you that I will All right. offer my beliefs, my affiliations. Stand away from the stand. Fight for the Bill of Rights which I'll you are trying to destroy. I'll man away from the stand. Yeah, paranoia associated with Soviet involvement, intelligence involvement, kind of reached uh, a point of almost becoming debilitating. In Korea, the Red Chinese have driven UN forces into full retreat. Then, the Chinese advance in Korea comes to a sudden halt. They have outrun their supply lines. The Soviet Union was supposed to be supplying with them with weapons, but the Chinese apparently were very discontented with the, the supply that was coming from the Soviet Union. There are stories of people in the Chinese, people's volunteers, sharing a gun between them or having ancient weapons that didn't work properly. Truman holds fire with his atomic weapons. The world lets out a long sigh of relief. American planes with conventional weapons batter the stalled Chinese forces. Air power is beginning to exert its full influence on the course of the Korean campaign. B-29 superfortresses take off on a mass raid. We photograph wave after wave of bomb-dropping giants blastering a target. The bombing raids on, on the North Korean cities were um, carried out using uh, fire bombing and napalm attacks. 
and these caused huge damage. A lot of the houses were, were very poorly built. They had, you know, thatch roofs, and so they burnt very easily. Much of Korea is almost bombed into oblivion. The most concentrated air offensive since Normandy. By mid-1951, armies of North and South Korea are facing each other pretty much where they'd started a year earlier. Peace talks begin. Communist war correspondents and their United Nations opposite numbers evidently get along quite well, though the truce talks were reported at this time as being sticky. A few days later, the Red General Nam Il led his delegation to the site, followed by the United Nations Party under Admiral Joy. Soon afterwards, it was reported that the Communists had at last agreed to a ceasefire position related to the existing battlefront, but there were still complications. One of the core problems was around prisoners of war. Under the Geneva Convention, really both sides were supposed to send the prisoners of war back to where they came from. But that actually was really complicated in the Korean War. Many communist prisoners feel it's not safe to go home. Some make a break for freedom. 3,600 of the communist prisoners took part in the insurrection, and the small United Nations garrison had to open fire or be overwhelmed. The UN POWs are trapped in North Korea as hostages. Later reports reveal the atrocities committed in the prisons. Well, I was taken into solitary confinement for uh, organizing escape committees and other illegal activities it was in the camp. They had various sorts of persecution, with boxes, beating up, bad food. Yes, yeah, so that's the site of um, we left I, but I uh, hope to get the site back again in the near future. Meanwhile, at the front, the carnage goes on. While the Red negotiators try by every means to hold up the talks, men of both sides are dying in the battle areas. The elephant in the room is Stalin. He presses the Chinese to keep the war going so he can study the weapons and techniques of his Cold War enemies. It's certainly clear that the Soviet Union took a very instrumentalist view of the Korean War. They were going to play it in the way that served their own interests best. Now for a duel between a Panther, an American naval fighter, and a Russian-built MIG-15. First pictures of this Soviet jet fighter with swept back wings, and it's the first time such a high-speed jet battle has been shown on the screen. Nobody knew this at the time, but many of the MiG fighter pilots are not North Korean or Chinese. They are Russian. These dogfights are the first time the USA and the USSR come into direct combat during the Cold War. Cold War superpowers are fighting each other directly in the skies above Korea. So yes, they sent uh, pilots in. They, they provided a certain amount of equipment, both to the, the North Koreans and the Chinese. But they were cautious not to send ground troops in, again, not in order not to cause that. Um, outbreak of a third world war. Then fate lends a hand. When from Moscow news of the stroke that ended Stalin's life spread round the world, it was all the more startling because so unexpected. Now Moscow mourns a man who rose from humble origin to rule from the splendor of the Kremlin, holding sway not only over the USSR, but also over the satellite countries. The passing now of the man who had so long directed worldwide communism must have far deeper implications. There may be small reason to believe in a favorable change of Soviet policy, but it is always right to hope. Stalin's successor is Gorgi Malenkov, a man not known for his good nature. Against all expectations, Malenkov breaks the deadlock. Despite intransigence from South Korea, he moves to convince China and North Korea to end the war. In July 1953, an armistice is signed. The South Korean government was actually opposed even to signing an armistice at the end of the war. Uh, so the armistice was signed by the US, but not actually by the South Korean government. It's one of the real sticking points to 
solving the problems on the Korean Peninsula today. In accordance with the truce agreement, the opposing forces now pulled back from one another. The open ground left between was to become the demilitarized zone, or DMZ. There was excitement, but little rejoicing. We have stopped the shooting. That means much to the fighting men and their families. And it will allow some of the grievous wounds of Korea to heal. Therefore, I am thankful. probably would be a good moment for the United Nations to look back and reflect on their role, on what it did to the global order in the Cold War era. I think the role of the UN in the Korean War just made it much more difficult for the UN to play a really neutral role in the Cold War. April. 1954. In less than a minute, you will see the most powerful explosion ever witnessed by human eyes. The atomic bombs dropped on Japan in 1945 were just the beginning. Since then, the USA has been developing a weapon a thousand times more powerful. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. The hydrogen bomb is so terrifying, even the people who worked on it question its use. The technical implications of the bomb, its colossal destructive power, and its ease of delivery by the new methods of rocket warfare convince me that if ever we are engaged again in a major war, it will mean the obliteration of our island home as a industrial center. It was a capability that even those of us that helped invent it just couldn't grasp. The H-bomb could make the horrors of the original atomic bomb look moderate. The Pacific is the chosen proving ground for the United States H-bomb experiment here amid vast ocean spaces far from human habitation. The scene is Eniwetok Atoll, a remote chain of coral islands about to take the shattering impact of the colossal detonation. Elutilab Island was the actual site, and around the shed which housed the H-bomb weapon, all sorts of measuring devices were set up. The last few seconds are counted. Three. Shockwaves of the world's first H-bomb rush towards the onlookers, and spellbound, they watch something never seen before. Fantastic in its form and in its power, a frantic addition to the arsenal of arms. The nuclear weapons uh, are very necessary, unfortunately. They should be very unnecessary, but it's like the genie's out of the bottle. The hydrogen bomb is the result of fusion, the incredible release of energy when atoms are split and fused together in stages. Later, a helicopter flew over, and the pilot found that the island had completely disappeared. Nothing there but water and a deep crater. Other islands of the atoll were stripped and scorched, everything on them withered or melted by the blast. With the H-bomb, the USA regains its position as the only world superpower. A soldier learns, as a nation must learn, that integrity, backed by strength, is the only sure way to lasting peace. Zero-hour bikini for the explosion of America's first airborne hydrogen bomb. Lights and radar reflectors define the target area, while the bomber, at a height of nine miles, peels off for the drop to be made at 50,000 feet. These pictures 
the first to be released were photographed from 50 miles away. The Americans are not just winning the arms race. They can instantly wipe the USSR from the map. All of the now 14 NATO countries are protected by the US nuclear umbrella, but the feeling of security is short-lived. I may say this, members of the Congress, be careful above all things, therefore, not to let go of the atomic weapon until you are sure, and more than sure, that other means of preserving peace are in your hands. Churchill and Eisenhower do not know the H-bomb secret is already out. The USSR has tested a small hydrogen bomb. 18 months after Eniwetok, the Soviets set off a full-size H-bomb. So big, it triggers detectors in the West. The largest detonation we ever had of a hydrogen bomb, the Soviets pulled off I think it was almost 100 megatons. You know, that's that's 10,000 times more powerful than one of the bombs used in, in World War II. So the, the scale of the thing just got out of control. News reports across the globe are horrified by the effects of the H-bomb if dropped on human populations. Here's another comparison. The explosion measured about three and a quarter miles in diameter. That's how it could strike in New York, the Empire State Building in the center. Any capital city could have its center devastated. There was almost an expectation that it was an enemy. We just lived every day with, with an expectation that it was only a matter of time. A war fought with these weapons is not a winnable war. But an Italian sculptor who makes cartoons with masks has evidently dreamt up a happy ending to the whole story. Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Malenkov, he implies, next produce the master weapon, the H-bomb. It will be a war that would wipe out most life on the planet. By 1955, East and West have reached a stage when a nuclear war might result in mutually assured destruction, M.A.D. Still, given goodwill on both sides, a solution can be found. In face of H-bomb, dubs of peace. February 1960, a major espionage operation is exposed. A secret American plane flies too low over Soviet airspace. The Soviet Union opens fire. On display in Moscow, what's alleged to be the wreckage of the U-2 spy plane, which Russia claims to have shot down by rocket. It includes photographs of the suicide needle and other equipment alleged to have been carried by the pilot. It was a, a great major uh, technical feat to have the, the U-2 performing aerial reconnaissance uh, over the Soviet Union. The plane is a U-2, a high-altitude plane that almost no one knows exists. It was on a mission to take aerial photographs of Soviet military bases. Our sense was that it was a major mistake. I mean, that was kind of how it was viewed. You know, how could an American pilot have gotten shot down by, you know, the Russians? We must have screwed up somewhere. The shoot down was a very um, great victory for, for the Soviet Union. The apparent killing of four of its crew members and the imprisonment of two others on trumped up spy charges as a shocking affront to the right of all nations. The maximum sentence for spying is execution. The Cold War becomes very personal. It's the Hall of Columns in Moscow, scene of many a previous Russian trial. And now, Francis Gary Powers, pilot of the American U-2 spy plane shot down over Russia, faced the judges with composure. He behaved with dignity throughout his ordeal, though his life was possibly at stake. Being sentenced to death for spying, I think, was, uh, in retrospect, I think, was likely. Uh, I think the Soviets were, you know, looking to make a statement. Here is Captain Powers, seen in a home movie film taken some time ago. 
Gary's wife and parents were in court for most of the time, a terrible ordeal for them naturally. The public trial is designed to humiliate the USA. The plain truth is this. When a nation needs intelligence activity, there is no time when vigilance can be relaxed. It was in the prosecution of one of these intelligence programs that the widely publicized U-2 incident occurred. The sentence, 10 years. It was sad, quite frankly, that uh, America had had uh, one of their airmen come into harm's way in this fashion. It was also sad for the country, and you could sense this, being embarrassed you know, politically like that. Both sides are neck and neck in the arms race that defines the Cold War. Next time on Mad World, revolution flares up on both sides of the Atlantic. They established a communist satellite right on the doorstep of the United States. There was a sense of excitement, a sense that there was something really important happening. Revolutionaries refused to surrender, so they went in and, uh, and crushed it. Leaving their parents, these two little boys reached the Austrian border, alone and half-starved. The Soviet Union leaps ahead in the arms race. Round and round the globe at 18,000 miles an hour, bleep bleeping to Moscow and the world. Awesome capabilities. But then you realize their purpose is destruction. And Western Europe prepares for nuclear war. The pre-calculated point would pull up into a 3G half loop and at 45 degrees release the weapon. You prepare for the worst and hope for the best.